In 1980, Seattle crab fishermen enjoyed their greatest season ever. When they went north the following year, they were stunned to discover that the king crab stocks had collapsed or disappeared. Seattle's distant water crab fleet had to find something else to do, fast. New entrants into the King Crab Gold Rush learned the hard way about the ups and downs of fishing. Bankrupt vessels lined the wharves of Ballard. It was, it was really sickening to uh, go to Fisherman's Terminal and see those boats sitting there, you know, burst, you know, two and three deep in, uh, for a while. Old timers dug deep and diversified. Diversification was the key. In those days, you could tender herring, tender salmon, fish a few crab. You just had to be afraid of high depth. Seattle's house-forward crabbers had been designed as combination vessels, able to fish with pots or nets. Most of them had stern ramps built in through bringing the, the uh, net uh, up on, onto the deck, uh, but it was plated over for you know, while they were fishing for crab. Um, the smarter designers and builders put shafting in them big enough for higher horsepower engines to be installed, uh, anticipating maybe someday they will have to be converted to uh, trawling. Jim Talbot launched the fishing style called Joint Venture Trawling that succeeded in ousting foreign fleets from U.S. fishing grounds. His father had established Bellingham Cold Storage in 1946. Seafood was always a major product line. In 1973, Talbot visualized the economic potential of an era of 200-mile limits. If the Japanese were first, the Soviet Union had established an even larger presence on the offshore fishing grounds of what were about to become American waters. To continue operating on the Eastern Pacific, the Soviets would need an American partner. I thought, well, uh, I'll propose a joint venture between Bellingham Cold Storage and the Ministry of Fisheries in, in the Soviet Union. So I um, wrote a letter to the Minister of Fisheries uh, back in 1973 um, uh, proposing that, uh, that we join a uh, joint venture because it was inevitable the United States was going out to 200 miles jurisdiction as were most of the countries around the world and I could just think of the millions and millions of pounds that we could have over our dock. Given the political climate of the era, Talbot's proposal seemed absurd. The 1970s marked the depths of the Cold War. The U.S. and the Soviet Union were on the brink of destroying one another with nuclear missiles. American defense policy was termed Mutual Assured Destruction, or MAD. The Iron Curtain hid Soviet society from Western eyes. Since the Sputnik launch put the first satellite in space, Americans harbored a dread of Soviet technological potency. There was virtually no economic cooperation between the superpowers. Talbot heard nothing for a year and a half. So I wrote another letter and, uh, to the Minister of Fisheries and said, uh, our uh, uh, postal system sometimes uh, doesn't get the letters delivered, and maybe the same thing is true in Russia, and perhaps it didn't arrive. And so anyway, there's a copy of the letter that I sent you uh, a year ago or a year and a half ago. And um, just within a couple of weeks, I got a uh, call from the fisheries attaché uh, telling me that they were um, uh, very interested in what I was uh, proposing. Within days of the passage of the Magnuson Act, a delegation from Sabriflot, the Soviet Fisheries Ministry, arrived in Seattle. So we negotiated for uh, oh, at least a couple of weeks, and then we signed the agreement. Uh, officially, we were in business. 
the Seattle-based firm Talbot named Marine Resources was unique. It was the only joint venture between the United States and the Soviet Union. When the deal was done, Talbot and his team headed to Moscow. We're sure that, that our hotel rooms were bugged, <clears throat> uh, always. And uh, there were times when uh, we'd find somebody in the room working on the bug uh, because it wasn't working well. And uh, they would uh, give some excuse about, well, I'm changing the light bulbs in the room or something like that. Uh, our uh, telephone in Seattle, I'm sure, was bugged by both sides. They opened offices in Seattle, Moscow, and Nahadka, the principal fishing port of the Soviet Far East. Talbot had a cold storage and a relationship with America's arch enemy. Now he had to determine the nature of his business. It quickly became clear that neither politics nor economics would permit Soviet motherships to deliver product to Bellingham. He hired federal biologist Wally Pereira to conceive the venture. Pereira understood that the obstacle keeping American fishermen off the high seas fishing grounds was the absence of a domestic processing sector. And so that's that was really one of the motivating factors. The Magnuson Act, plus the, the fact that the, the Soviets at that time had in excess of two million uh, gross tons of capacity, fishing capacity. They had, you know, motherships all over the world. And so it was the opportunity maybe to work out an arrangement whereby we could, uh, you know, have American fishermen delivering to foreign vessels. That was really the motivating thought in my mind. They would test the concept by fishing for Pacific whiting off the Oregon coast and transferring product to a Soviet mothership on the high seas. Pereira approached Oregon trawler man Barry Fisher. He was very skeptical because he, he was fishing along the coast and was getting you know the traditional prices for, for the, the flatfish species. But we're talking about whiting. That was, that was the initial species, or hake, as it was called then. And um, I had to show Barry that if you could fish whiting at a nickel a pound and be able to deliver you know, substantial quantities of it at sea, you, your costs would be much lower, and the volume of fish that you'd be able to move would make that profitable for you. The idea of, f of having a factory ship follow me around to immediately take my production that production would be in the nature of 50, 60, 70, 80 tons a day. The price could be very low to pay both paid to us and that the consumer would pay and it would be a high quality product because it was processed so fast. Fisher and his American counterparts would have to make substantial investments in boats and gear. They would have to teach themselves the fishing method called midwater trawling. It was a gamble. And the Soviets weren't told much either. They showed up off our coast with orders to look for a boat named the Lady of Good Voyage, and the captain's name was Barry Fisher, and you're going to go on a joint venture with him. And we're trying to prove that he can catch enough fish to keep the factory ship going. But we didn't get the political permission to go until 1978, 1978. There was only about a month left of the season. During that month, we taught ourselves to midwater trawl. For 10 days, it was no sleep, gear follow-ups, uh, not getting the net fished right, uh, snarling it, putting it on the bottom, tearing it up. And those were pretty bad times. Pereira and his Soviet counterpart within Marine Resources, Valery Latichev, were aboard Fisher's boat as observers. Pereira noticed the difficulties and ventured a suggestion. Barry was just pulling his hair. He had this new vessel. It wasn't he was having some problems with the vessel. Then he was having problems with the nets and the doors and everything. And he was just beside himself. It was hot. And I can remember to this day, you know, Barry up there in a wheelhouse. He had to, this had this um, white T-shirt on, and his hair was all awry from running up and down and so forth. And and Larry and I were up in the wheelhouse, and so I, I said, Barry, I said, you know, I've been watching what you've been doing in there. You know, you might, uh, you might want to do, and before I ever got the word out of my mouth, Barry turned on me like, and I, you know, and he, I can't, I can't repeat what he said, but <laughs> the longest short of it is, you get out of the wheelhouse, there's only room for one, there's only room for one captain on this boat, and I'm the captain, 
<laughs> and he says, I don't want you up here anymore. And then the last 10 days of that month, everything clicked. And I put in over 800 tons in 10 days. The Soviet captains liked to test drive the high-tech American trawlers. They held the American captains to 35-ton catch limits. Because anytime we'd make a delivery, it had to be 35 tons. But when they got there, they wanted Bolshoi. They wanted, you know, they wanted big, big caught in to deliver, to show that they were good fishermen, you know. So the trade was fun, too. It was totally against the totally against the laws of both countries, but we were trading blue jeans for, blue jeans for fur hats, rock and roll cassettes for, bala, you know, for balalaika music. Uh. The, the relationship between the fishermen and the Russian vessels became very personal. I mean, the captains, the, the captains got to know each other, um, and there was, there, there was you know, general, genuine warmth between, the, between the both sides, and I think that's one of the reasons why it was successful. It, it, we rapidly built a camaraderie, and that, that cement, that was the cement that made the joint venture succeed. Marine resources operated on a barter system. The Soviets got paid in hard currency. Marine resources got paid in king crab. Uh, for example, a, a, ton of, uh, a ton of frozen king crab was, I think, 26 and a half hake units. So that meant that for every ton of king crab that we got as barter, they got um, 26 and a half tons of hake. The Soviet processing hands were paid on a share basis. The more they produced, the more they earned. The Soviet government hadn't counted on profit-motivated productivity. That first year, they wound up making, uh, making far more than very senior people in the government. For example, the, the, the fish factory workers were making more than an admiral in the Soviet Navy. Of course, by the next year, they they readjusted it downwards. American fishermen made a lot of money. Bellingham Coal Storage made money. Sauberflot made money. It was really good business. Enterprises like that should oftentimes be considered that's probably the most valuable way that, that any two societies can get along with each other. It was economically profitable and socially it was a lot of fun. And philosophically I think it taught both of us on both sides a lot about things that we'd always taken for granted. And it, uh, it totally destroyed the idea that the Russians were the bad guys.